All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Elizabeth Perkins, and I'm one of the newest faculty members with the Otology Group at Vanderbilt. And to kind of break up your series of lectures on endoscopic ear surgery, uh, I thought we'd throw in a lecture about cochlear implantation. As hearing rehabilitation surgeons, all of us are typically pretty passionate um, about cochlear implants and hearing rehabilitation surgery in general. And I think we always have the philosophy that we want to do more. And I think in order to do that, we have to really think about some of the barriers to cochlear implantation, which I'm gonna to touch on today. And then some of the innovations that surround patient-centered healthcare that we've done at Vanderbilt to help overcome some of those barriers. So these are my team disclosures. I personally do not have any disclosures today. So we know that there's 48 million people in the United States with hearing loss and about 2 million of those with severe to profound hearing loss. Um, and despite that, our hearing aid penetrance is only 16%. And we know that there are around 1.3 million people that are estimated to meet cochlear implant candidacy criteria. Uh, but despite that, our cochlear implant prevalence is around anywhere from 2 to 12.7%. Um, and this really suggests us that, this, that there's this underutilization of cochlear implant te te technology. And this underutilization can really be contributed to lack of education and care complexity, uh, which will really be the theme of my talk today. So if you're to break down the process for someone to undergo a cochlear implant, it really begins all the way from when a patient is diagnosed with hearing loss. They're then referred to an audiologist or even determined to be a cochlear implant candidate. And then they referred again to a surgeon or cochlear implant audiologist for the CI evaluation and workup, of course, undergo the surgery and the long process of cochlear implant rehabilitation after surgery. So really starting at the beginning of all of this, um, we know that even getting a diagnosis of hearing loss is a barrier. So 32% of patients who self-reported hearing loss haven't even seen a professional, including even a primary care provider and audiologist. And the average duration of someone that has severe profound hearing loss with our diagnosis is 10 years. And when we looked at from 2013, 2015, and I'll go into the study in a little bit detail later, um, the average PTA of patients who referred to Vanderbilt over that two year time period who underwent a cochlear implant was 90 decibels, which is very low. And we know that this delayed diagnosis of hearing loss is leading to a prolonged period of deafness. And we know that the prolonged period of deafness is decreasing our outcomes in cochlear implants. And you think about our frontline providers, you know, those include our primary care physicians. Um, these are the people that are seeing patients in their office, but they have no universal screening for hearing loss. But for adults, we know that for children, there's, you know, the newborn hearing screen in the one, three, and six model. But the problem is, is that majority of our cochlear implant referrals don't even come from a primary care provider, a, a very small percentage, just about 3%. Um, and the challenge is, is that audiology practices are not linked to your primary care provider. Um, and that requires a referral from the primary care provider to the audiologist. And of course, there's travel and time burdens for any referral. And then once someone is even diagnosed with hearing loss, uh, really identifying them to be a cochlear implant candidate is probably one of the biggest barriers that we face. And despite all of our expanding indications, you know, asymmetric hearing loss, you know, EAS, so low, good low frequency hearing, um, uh, age of implantation, you know, despite all these expanding indications, variable practice exists even between audiologists and surgeons. And there, we know that there's a huge mismatch between the number of patients with sensorial hearing lo loss and those who are even referred for a cochlear implant. Um, and like I said before, when we looked at all of our patients who were referred to Vanderbilt for cochlear implant workup, they had a mean CNC score of 10%. And their PTA was around 80 decibels, which is extremely low, meaning that there's this whole cohort of patients that are doing, that are above 10% that, that we're not even touching. And then we looked at our, the similar numbers, so the similar cohort of patients, but from 2015 to 2020, um, and that all of this data is, is, is in draft for manuscript and is submitted, but we since improved to, improved to a CNC score of 15%. And our 80 and 84 decibel average PTA for all of those patients. And that's really showing that we're doing a little bit better, but not good enough. Um, and University of Michigan published our 6060 guidelines for Medicare patients. So what does that mean? Saying that, you know, audiologists should begin referring a patient for a cochlear implant workup when their PTA is worse than 60 and their word recognition scores 
is 60 percent or lower uh, but the problem with it is that that's really limited to medicare patients and that that criteria for implantation is dependent on insurance provider and you're really relying on the audiologist to make that decision of when to refer someone for a candidate and that's extremely challenging and with better guidelines we can help relieve the burden of this decision making so once someone's at their cochlear implant workup, it's even getting the patient to qualify that can be really variable. And we know that our cochlear implant criteria, which is going to be a whole, whole talk in itself, are variable depending on the insurance provider. And there's significant variability in our testing methods, even from institution to institution. So are you testing a patient in noise? Are you qualifying them in noise only um, or no noise at all? And that variability makes it challenging to have a universal uh, cochlear implant referral process. Um, and we know that single side deafness, asymmetric hearing loss, and EAS candidacy is still being debated. Um, and the really challenge is, is that if you're relying on that Medicare criteria, um, which is really our most vulnerable population, so it's older patients who typically have worse hearing. And if you're waiting for, for someone to qualify in that best aided condition, sometimes that poor, that better hearing ear has to deteriorate until someone becomes a candidate. And that's leading to that prolonged duration of deafness. You know, at Vanderbilt, we are a very high volume center, and in most high volume centers across the country, we're, we tend to do more off label in, in implantations than other institutions. So, for cochlear implant surgery, we know there's a lack of general knowledge in the population. So, you know, patients really don't even, I've never even heard of a cochlear implant when they come to the office, um, which is a challenge in itself. And there's this stigma around implant surgery. So I'm sure a lot of you have seen the movie Sound of Metal, um, which really portrays cochlear implantation in, in, in a certain way. Um, and it's difficult to transition a patient from a hearing aid to a cochlear implant because you know, they're no longer wearing a hearing, but they're actually wearing an implanted devi device. Of course, all the patients struggle with the loss of residual hearing and that difference in their hearing from acoustically to electronically. Um, and we know that really provider encouragement and the presentation of this information is crucial to these outcomes, um, particularly between the audiologist and the surgeon. And the whole, there's a whole other barrier of race, your insurance provider, and age, which can all impact our cochlear implant candidacy. Um, and we're going to publish this as well, hopefully later this year, because it's in submission as well. But there's another paper I'll go into later that will touch on this. So really beginning in more detail looking at when someone becomes a candidate to getting them to, to surgery there's you know so many barriers so this includes social barriers practical inconvenience uh, fear of surgery lack of provider knowledge and support and system barriers um, so i'm going to touch a little bit on each of these and how we can do better to really um, overcome and help patients climb this mountain so this is a really nice paper out of ut southwestern where they looked at the demographics of patients undergoing implantation at, the, at their cochlear implant center. And what they found was, you know, that females are more likely to qualify. Um, Non-white patients are more likely to qualify, but less likely to pursue surgery. Um, and a married or uh, a single and widowed individual is more likely to qualify. Um, and of course, private insurance patients um, are more, also more likely to qualify for cochlear implant candidacy. And then, if you look at their logistic regression analysis, it once again confirmed that non-white individuals were, were less likely to pursue cochlear implant surgery, including single individuals. So they concluded that, you know, the rates of surgical pursuit is lower for racial minorities, single and widowed patients, and older patients. So even from the very beginning, just being a part of these demographic variables can make you less likely uh, to pursue cochlear implant surgery. Uh, so this is a nice study out of the UK um, and Australia where they interviewed um, audiologists, primary care physicians, and patients about what they thought uh, were some barriers to cochlear implantation in general. So they, they categorized things into ma main barriers and then main facilitators for CI uptake. So the things I said were on that nice diagram of the mountain that I showed you. So fear of surgery. This includes lack of support and knowledge. So it's really important for patients to have a primary care provider who is supportive and knowledgeable cochlear implants. Um, and this really education is something that, that we can help. Um, of course, the practical inconvenience of, of taking time off work and, and driving 
to the institution, driving for their, their imaging and driving for their cochlear implant workup, all of that is a big convenience. Um, of course, the social barriers, I mentioned this before, so hearing negative stories about cochlear implants, um, and that's why it's so important that we provide patients access to support groups. And of course, system and organizational barriers, so limited access in rural areas, and of course, all the challenges associated with living in a rural era rural area and traveling to a large cochlear implant center. And things that they concluded is that uh, the waiting lists were off-putting for patients. Um, patients were really concerned about taking time off work um, and that they really wanted to know more knowledge about co cochlear implant recipient success stories. Um, and in general, we conclude that information, so education, about cochlear implants was a key matter for both patients and my primary care providers. And that's something that we really need to take home is that this is an area that we can do better. And that's all comes down to underutilization equals complexity of care and education. Uh, so this is a nice paper that um, Dr. Holder wrote with Renee Gifford. Uh, it was published in 2018 and we're just going to publish an update to this. So we're looking at the demographics of all of our patients that were referred to us from 2013 to 2015. Um, and of the 51 patients that came to us that were not referred for or did not undergo implantation, 40% were lost to follow-ups. The majority of them were just lost. 32% did not meet candidacy. Uh, and 14% did not pursue implantation for medical reasons. And then another remainder, 14% just said, I'm not interested. Uh, and, and really we wanna look at about how do we capture those that did not pursue implantation and those that were lost to follow up. Um, and what we really decided is that we just need to provide greater education regarding the surgical procedure and complications and discuss the needs for adding remote microphone technology. So that Bluetooth technology is very important to the patients and their outcomes. And that, you know, another reason that potential candidates that may not present for their preoperative workup or come to the surgeon after their workup might be just due to lack of education. And then you get to see among the patients, general ENTs, and of course, their primary care providers. So, you know, when really thinking about how can we overcome some of these barriers from getting someone to from a cochlear implant candidate to surgery? What can we do as an institution to really maybe think about our system barriers? Um, and when we at Vanderbilt, this thinking about this whole process really led to the development of our same day cochlear implant program. So Tennessee is a very wide state. So it spans 400 plus miles. So someone living in Johnson City can travel up to five hours, just one way to get to Nashville. And if you're thinking, if I'm a cochlear implant patient and I'm driving five hours just for my appointment to meet my surgeon, this excludes my imaging and my cochlear implant workup and my rehabilitation appointments, that's a significant time burden, time off work and financial sacrifice. Uh, and so we looked at our, our process map uh, of when a patient is first referred to our institution and when they undergo surgery. And we counted that the, the time from referral to surgery was 136 days. And this is up to 18 hours of active work and three or more trips to and from the institution. And if you add up all this non-value added time between all these appointments, that was 22 weeks in two days. And when you're thinking about duration of deafness and implanting, providing greater, greater access to care, this is a huge problem. And we thought, okay, how can we condense this process to reduce this travel burden and non-added value wait time for our patients? And that was through our same day cochlear implant program. And what does that really mean? So this means that patients come to our institution, their, their information is loaded into the computer, we have a dedicated cochlear implant audiologist who reviews their records, determine if they would be a good candidate for implantation, and then calls the patient, determines if they would be interested in our same-day cochlear implant program, which oftentimes the answer is yes. So the patient is scheduled for same-day imaging, audiologic cochlear implant candidacy testing and device selection, meeting the surgeon, meeting with their cochlear implant coordinator, they're walked to the OR and they undergo implantation that same day. A lot of times patients will be activated that next day, so they'll stay overnight um, or they can come back and be activated. So we know that this 
this, this model is patient centered and has reduced our referral to surgery time to 24, 24 days from 136 days. So this new model emphasizes patient satisfaction. So it reduces that referral to surgery time from 136 to 24 days, significantly minimizes travel burden. And we, we come on this idea that the care really begins before arrival to campus. So this begins with upfront patient education. So as soon as patients are contacted, they're provided educational videos about cochlear implants. Uh, pamphlet information about all the device manufacturers. So you can imagine as a patient that the, the problem is, is that they're, they're asked to make a big decision about which manufacturer the day that they're undergoing surgery. So if we provide them that information to undergo implantation before, when, once they arrive on campus, it makes things much less anxiety provoking for the patients. So they provide all the permission they need, access to a specific coordinator to answer any questions, and oftentimes we even schedule a telehealth appointment with beforehand so they meet their care team so they're they're ready on, on on the day that they arrive on campus and this has really led to the segue of a bundled payment model so we know the idea of a bundled payment model is not really new so it's really common in maternity spine and for orthopedics uh, but of course like why not apply this to ent but keeping that patient-centered mindset so this providing a predictable payment bundle and services can really marketed to purchasers, including insurance companies and large employers. Um, and we just launched this last year um, and we're working to really how, how can we capture more patients to provide them with abundant payment model for cochlear implantation. So in conclusion, uh, the barriers to cochlear implantation really begin with diagnosis of hearing loss and cochlear implantation is underutilized with an average rate of up to 12.7%. And then we know that improving the referral criteria for audiologists can help relieve the, des the decision-making burden. And education of primary care providers and audiologists can improve awareness and referrals. And accounting for our system barriers within your own institution can really improve cochlear implant access to care. So hope everyone enjoys the rest of the course. Uh, if anyone has any questions, you can feel free to get my contact information from Megan Franklin. Uh, everyone have a great day.